All right. Everybody turn in their problem sets. They have all the problem sets. Going once, going twice. Andrew's going to hand the files over. Okay. All right. Here's our topics. Um, four minutes on banking. Shh. Brief overview of northern versus southern agriculture. Uh, today we focus on the cotton south and slavery. On Tuesday we'll talk about the north. The material on Tuesday does go a little bit into the postbellum period just because I didn't want to have the midterm on the day after a three-day weekend. The midterm is a week from today. The rooms are up here on the board. Some of you are in this room. Some are in 10 Evans. Uh, you do not need to bring a blue book. We'll provide you with exam booklets. All you need to bring is a pen or a pencil to write with. Um, and uh, what else do I want to tell you? The format, I haven't written it yet, so I can't tell you much about it, but the format will be similar to fall of 06. So if you look at the different sections in the fall of 06 midterm, that's the, the general format that will follow. I'll follow. And uh, any quick questions that I might be able to answer? Will there be review sessions? There will be review sessions, so we're planning you want three o'clock on Thursday? No, Wednesday. Wednesday, the day before. <laughs> okay. Okay, so they're planning to do a joint review session the day before the midterm, three to five. Patrick, same question. All right. Okay, so our music today was uh, gospel music in honor of the fact that we're doing slavery today. So. Uh, but we're going to start with three or four minutes on banking, just to wrap up what I didn't get to on Tuesday. Some of the stuff that's on the slides I'm going to skip over real fast because it's covered in the book and I don't want to take time away from my real point today. The free banking era is 1836 to 1864. Uh, 1836 is when we have the, the end of the second bank of the United States. It's also when we have the first states that pass laws that allow individuals who want to start a bank to simply meet a set of rules. So instead of going to the state legislature and getting a special act of the state legislature to allow you and your friends to open a bank, uh, if you meet the bureaucrat set, set of rules, you go in, you demonstrate you've done that. Stamp, 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 the, the downside of the free bank, one of the downsides of the free banking era is that each bank was issuing its own currency. So for instance, when you got a dollar from the Bank of Lexington, it says at the top, the Bank of Lexington. It doesn't say Federal Reserve note, it doesn't say United States note, it says the Bank of Lexington. Now the Bank of Lexington issued this, it's a $5 note, but it's payable at Graham in the state of North Carolina. So if you take that $5 note from the Bank of Lexington and you present it someplace in New England, you may not get $5 for it. Here's another one from the Delaware City Bank. This is a $1 note dated 1854. And this again, this says it's established on a specie basis, so you know that there's supposedly gold or silver behind it. But yet, again, if you want $1 for that piece of paper, you know you can get a dollar for it at the Delaware City Bank. You have no guarantee that you can get 100 cents, a full dollar for it anyplace else. Oh, how do they manage these exchange rates? Well, good question. Here we go. So one of the challenges then, of course, is the, the discount rate. So when, when you are taking a $5 note from the Bank of Lexington and presenting it for, for transaction in Boston, what's the discount rate? Are they going to give you 85% discount at 15%? Are they going to give you 90% of the value? These discount rates are affected by those same asymmetric information problems that we talked about the other day. The people who are presenting these notes know more about the bank's healthiness and then, excuse me, then does the person who's accepting the note. And even the person who's presenting the note may not know as much about the bank's healthiness as the bank does itself. So the redemption rates or the discount rates, they varied with how far you were from the originating bank. Uh, they varied with the known capital asset value of the originating bank. They varied with the location of the originating bank. So Michigan bank notes circulated at a lower rate than the bank notes from, from Massachusetts. And they varied with the general reputation. So if a particular bank had a bad reputation for um, not always honoring their obligations, those notes would circulate at a lower rate than would other notes. The, how did they get the information? There were things that were called the bank note and commercial reporter. Thompson's was one. Another one is illustrated in your textbook. It's Sheldon's note, note detector and commercial reporter. These were printed volumes that were purchased by bankers. And in these volumes, they would have information about each bank and then a description of the What's the word I want? Fraudulent, not fraudulent. Um, counterfeit, there it is. Of the counterfeit notes that were circulating. So there you are in Boston. You get a $5 note that's presented from the Bank of Lexington. You go and you get this book and you open it. And you go to North Carolina. And then you go to the Bank of Lexington. And then you go to the $5 notes from the Bank of Lexington and you read it. And this is going to describe for you what the counterfeit notes look like. So this one says, for instance, from the Bank of Louisiana, New Orleans, a $50, or excuse me, Louisiana State Bank in New Orleans, a $50 note that's counterfeit has the female in her right hand holds a sword and her left arm rests on a sheet of wheat. A bridge, train of cars, etc. are on her right. Right over here on her right, or would that be on her right as you look at it? It's not clear. Uh, a broad dark colored band on the right and the left margin, one having the figure 50, the other having the word 50. The note reads, the Louisiana State Bank will pay $50 to the bearer on demand. All these particulars are different from the genuine note, although in their general appearance they are very much the same. Oh man. So that's kind of a hard process, right? To figure out how much they're going to give you for that $50 note. Why do they describe the counterfeit and not the real ones? Uh, I don't know. Um, probably, uh, they just did. So, uh, description, we have not seen these bills. Possibly it's also because they're listing, we know that these things have been circulating, right? Colin. That's a good point. Yeah, describing all the details of an actual note. And, and they didn't have the technology to just put a JPEG in there, right? This is, so, could be, they could be not wanting to give the counterfeiters the, money, the information, but I think the counterfeiters were ahead of the game anyway. So, so this is a big problem because a dollar is not worth a dollar, depending upon where you are. How do we lower the risk of redeeming paper currency? This I'm going to leave you to read in the textbook and skip it. But remember the other day we had for asymmetric information in theory, the possible ways of addressing asymmetric information were regulation uh, requirements and um, monitoring. And so in the textbook it describes these three methods. But the long and the short of it is this difficulty with currency redemption, where a dollar from North Carolina was not necessarily worth a dollar in some other state, led to a lot of difficulties with interstate commerce because you didn't have a common currency that was circulating that would allow uh, the payment in bills uh, uh, in one state for goods that were delivered from another state. There was a push to come up with a common currency, to come up with a national currency, to eliminate this series of having separate currencies bank by bank. The numbers I showed you the other day, by 1860, we had 1,500 different banks, each of which were issuing their own currency. And so you had, if you had a 1, 2, 5, 10, 20, 50, 100 dollar bill, you'd have 15 times 7 is a lot of different currencies that were circulating in the country. This was a huge problem for interstate commerce. It's a huge problem for people who were moving around. But there's not a, a consensus in Congress to do something about this because the South is very opposed to any sort of exertion of federal power, and the South stands opposed to creating a federal currency. So this problem is we'll see next week, week after next. Eventually get solved, but it gets solved while the South has seceded from the Union. So there's a whole bunch of legislation we're going to see that gets passed during the Civil War when the South has left the United States, which means that the Southerners are not there in Congress blocking all this stuff. So this was one of the things that the South had been blocking that will get passed in the 1860s,
The United States remains an agricultural nation throughout the antebellum period, anto before Bellum War, so before the Civil War period. Uh, this table number two from the handout for this week and next shows you the breakdown of the labor force, slave, uh, the free agricultural labor force, and the free non-ag labor force. And it shows you also the total number. And you can see that oops, here. Uh, by 1860, the free non-ag labor force is 42% of the total. So we're still overwhelmingly an agricultural labor force uh, throughout this antebellum period. It's not until the 1880s that we reach the point where we have less than 50% of the labor force in agriculture. So we're an agricultural nation throughout this antebellum period. There is some manufacturing going on, but the big story is ag. Northern part of the country is getting settled in this antebellum period. This table number three shows you uh, when various places became states. Let me fill it in. You can see that it moves from, from east to west. So Ohio becomes a state in 1803. Indiana becomes a state in 1816. Illinois becomes a state in 1818. Missouri becomes a state in 1821. In the next decade, in 1837, Michigan becomes a state jumping to another decade, uh, in the 1840s, Iowa and Wisconsin become states, and then in the 1850s, Minnesota becomes a state. So we've got this migration westward, uh, in areas could become states once they had 100,000 in population, uh, and I take that back, areas become, become states once they had, I forget the numbers, uh, a certain number of people, 50,000 I think, um, men of voting age, and then it could become a state. Close, doesn't the specifics, I don't care. This shows you the same thing, so it shows you the population trends, 1830 on the left, 1850 on the right, uh, people per square mile, the darker the shading, the more dense the population, so the uh, population is in 1830, less than two people uh, per square mile in what we would think of now as the west and even in parts of the south, and then here look 20 years later, it's a huge difference in the map. Um, oh, it's a difference in the scale too, never mind, that doesn't help me out very much. Uh, but, but the fewer than two is still the same, that was kind of nasty of them to change that with it. So the green was fewer than two, uh, here the, the whatever that color is is fewer than two, and you can see that the population has moved westward uh, over that 20 year period. We'll talk more about the northern farms on Tuesday, but just to set up a little contrast, the northern farms are primarily fa family farms. So by north, of course, we mean what we would now call the Midwest. Uh, are primarily family farms. There's relatively little hired labor. Uh, there's no slave labor on the, the northern, or what we would call today Midwestern farm. Primary activities in that area, uh, grains, so wheat, that sort of thing. Corn, animal husbandry, so cows, sheep, goats, that sort of thing. The size of these farms in 1860, the median farm was 49 acres. The mean farm was 64 acres. Remember that a section, a one mile by one mile section, that was 640 acres. A quarter section would be 160. A quarter quarter section would be a 40 acre amount. So these are relatively small farms. They're not even as large as a quarter section. We can get a sense of how evenly or unevenly distributed the farmland is in the Northwest by looking at the Gini coefficient. The Gini coefficient is a statistic that economists use to measure the dispersion or the distribution of some variable. We've talked about Gini coefficients in other classes in the context of what the distribution of income in the United States, what's the distribution of wealth. For a point of comparison, the, the Gini coefficient for the United States today is about 0.48. So that's today's Gini coefficient. As you know, I hope that's an increase over time. About 30 years ago, the Gini coefficient in the United States was 0.39. So we worried about 0.4 Gini coefficient. Um, about 30 some years ago, and now it's up. I've done all these pages. And now it's up about 0.48. So let's look at the northern farms. Here are the northern farms. This is from the, right, the article by Gavin Wright that's in your. Uh, reader, okay. Gavin Wright. I get confused. I always knew how to say his name, and then Gavin Newsom showed up, and Gavin and Gavin say their names differently, and I always have to try to remember if it's Gavin Newsom or Gavin Newsom, and then I can remember if it's Gavin Wright or Gavin Wright. Gavin Newsom. Is that right? The mayor of San Francisco. Gavin. So Gavin Wright. So it's kind of a you know, unique name, and to have two different pronunciations is annoying, but never mind. All right, so what do we get? 1860, looking at these Gini coefficients, these are relatively evenly distributed. There's not a bad skewing. I'm going to show you the south in a few minutes to show you some really skewed distribution. There's not a bad skewing of the difference in farm size, farm by farm. You can also get that by looking at the mean versus the median. The closer the mean and the median are to each other, the smaller the, the dispersion, the more equal the distribution. So Minnesota had, the, in 1860, the most equal distribution of farmland in this period, uh, in this area, excuse me. Illinois had the least equal. Their Gini was 0.46, but these are all below what the Gini coefficient is today for the distribution of income in the United States. Contrast, southern farms. In the south, the south was a combination of, of family farms and large slave plantations. These things are there side by side. So this figure is for 1830, and it's showing you that in 1830, 64% of the farms in the south were free farms, were family farms with no slaves. So two-thirds of the farms in the south in 1830 had no slaves on them. Uh, the, the percentage of the farms that had lots and lots of slaves was just 2.5%. So there was 18% uh, were farms that had five or fewer slaves, 16% rounding were, sla were farms that had between five and 50 slaves, and 2.5-3% were farms that had 50 or more slaves here in 1830. This changes over the antebellum period. Over the antebellum period, we get an increase in this share of really large farms as the uh, slavery and cotton production migrates west. I'm going to show you some charts in just a second. So southern farms, this mix, small family farms, really large plantations. Primary activities, cotton is the number one thing, and that's what we're going to talk about the most, is cotton growing. There's also growing of tobacco, particularly in the Chesapeake Bay area, which is the area around Maryland and Virginia, um, as well as other areas. Tobacco is a big crop in, in Kentucky, where my partner's from. Uh, her grandfather ran a, uh, ran, owned a tobacco farm. Um, corn is also grown throughout the South. Corn is a crop both as a feed crop uh, and also as a consumable crop. This is a picture that shows you for 1850, the various activities that are taking place uh, in the South. Let me point out, well, I guess I can circle things. Um, most people usually want me to point out the hemp, so let me start there. So the hemp, which was used not only for marijuana, but was also used um, for twine and rope and so on, uh, is grown then and now in the, the hills of Kentucky. Um, let me erase as I go along. Um, we get corn that's being grown throughout this sort of orangey region is corn. Tobacco, you can see here's the Chesapeake area, and here's the Kentucky growing area for tobacco. So tobacco is really up there in the Chesapeake and then over here in Kentucky. And then this big swath of pinkish, at least down here, and I don't know what color that is up there. This big swath here, this is all cotton. So that's why we talk about the cotton south, because when you look at the map and you look at what was being grown in the south, that's the big piece, is the cotton. So there's tobacco. Um, the tobacco is not being grown, at least in Kentucky, the tobacco is, is not primarily a slave crop. Um, in the Chesapeake, it's, they use slaves, but there are small numbers of slaves on the tobacco farms. Uh, but the cotton, as we'll see, is the, the crop where the slave labor is used in particular. The median size of farms is 71 acres in 1860. The mean size is 136. That's a big difference and, and belies a big uh, Gini coefficient for the south as a whole. The Gini coefficient is 0.60 in 1860. That distributional 
difference varies by region within the South. If we try to think about the South in one breath, and we think about there's the North and there's the East and there's the South, we don't really have the chance to understand Southern history and to understand, in effect, the development of this country. We need to get a sense of some of the regions. And so in the article in your reader by Gavin Wright, he has this map uh, that shows you the regions in the South. He's got oh, nine or so different regions. We're not going to have to learn all of them, but you do have to learn a few. So the alluvial region, alluvial, A-L-L-U-V-I-A-L, the alluvial region, let me use a highlighter here. The alluvial region goes along the edges of the Mississippi River and also along the Red River, which cuts up through Louisiana and then forms this border here between Texas and Oklahoma. So that area is called the alluvial region. And the alluvial is very, very productive. In the alluvial region, they get between 1,500 and 2,000 pounds of cotton per acre. That number doesn't have any context yet. It will in just a second. A second region that we're going to focus on in color, I'll make this bluish, is the Western Upland region. And the Western Upland region is the more up, and I'm going to show you a Google map in just a second that really makes this clear, the more up regions that, are, that border the alluvial. In this western upland region, the cotton that they grow, they're growing about 500, they're able to produce between 500 and 1,000 pounds of cotton per acre. So it's not as productive as the alluvial region, uh, but the contrast then is with the Piedmont, oh, choose a color, I'll choose this color. And the Piedmont is the foothills to the southeast of the, Ap excuse me, to the southeast of the Appalachians and the Great Smokies. And so this area, which I've drawn in here, this is the Piedmont, and in the Piedmont, they get between 500 and 800 pounds of cotton per acre. So there's huge differences in the productivity of the land. Those big differences in productivity of the land have a genesis, interesting choice of word, that is millions of years before. So um, in a few slides, not yet, in a few slides, I'll show you, I'm not going to show you yet, I'll show you the uh, Google Earth slide in a, in a little bit and you'll see where this, these differences come from. So what's the distribution? In the alluvial region, the Gini coefficient is 0.67. In the western upland set area, the Gini coefficient is 0.54. So we've got a big difference. These are large differences in the skewness of the distribution of farm size between these regions. In the alluvial, the alluvial, you've got those big plantations, the sort of things that are epic in Gone with the Wind or whatever other place you want to get your sort of history from. Uh, and side by side with a few small family farms. In the, the Piedmont, and in the Piedmont, you've got some of that, but you don't have the huge 1,000-acre plantations in the Piedmont. So you may have some large uh, farms that have 45, 50, 55 slaves, but you don't have the places that have hundreds of, of slaves on them. And then in the Western Upland, you can see the relative small size of these farms. You're more likely to have family farming uh, in the Western Upland with some slave farming mixed in. Cotton. What we're talking about is cotton. So there's a picture of a cotton field. If you've never seen cotton growing, that's it. Cotton grows on plants, and the cotton fields, if you drive around the alluvial, the alluvial area is flat as can be. It is denuded of trees, and it is just cotton and planting. Today it's soy, as much as anything, from one end to the other. So those are lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of different cotton plants. When, here comes my prop, uh, when they pick the cotton, this is a picture of, oh, wait, where's, where's my word, of cotton bowls, and I brought Sammy Freddy's baguette for a reason. So when they go through, there's no cotton in here. Um, this was fresh last night, but it's less fresh today. So when they go through and they pick the cotton, here, we're going to take this and pass it around. There you go. And I wouldn't eat it by the time you sit back, because you don't know people have washed their hands or not. So pass them up. They pick the cotton, and, and part of picking the cotton is, is pulling the bowl, the white part, pulling the bowl of cotton off of the plant. And then another piece of picking of the cotton process then is to get the seeds out of the fibers. So I thought about taking the seeds off of this bread and putting them inside of cotton balls, but I only had one cotton ball left in the bathroom this morning, so I didn't do that. Um, here's another one. Uh, now, some of the seeds are large. So if you look at the seeds on this bread, some of the seeds on this bread are relatively large, but some of the seeds on this bread are pretty small. So if you, as this bread comes up, here you go. As the bread comes up, you look at the different sizes of the seeds on the bread, and imagine trying to pick the seeds out of the cotton. So see these little dots there that you're trying to figure out? See that little dot right where my red laser is? That's not your glasses. That's actually there. So imagine, after working in the field all day, which is going to make your hands really rough, right? It's not going to be like in a manicure. Imagine trying to pull that little seed out of the cotton fibers. Because if they're going to take the cotton fibers and turn it into fabric or paper, the seeds have to be pulled out. Now, some of the cotton that was grown had relatively long seeds. So here you can see a big seed. In the bread that's going up, some of the seeds are pretty long, right? Some of those seeds, you can pick off of that bread pretty easily even if you don't have very good fingernails. Some of the seeds on that bread as it goes up, I dare you to try to get the seeds off. The poppy seeds that are on that bread, it's pretty hard to get those poppy seeds off. Maybe if you're trying to pick it off with your fingernails, you've got good fingernails, but you're not going to have good fingernails after working out in the fields for a day. And so it's pretty hard to get the seeds out. The cotton gin is an invention that separates the seeds from the fiber. What the cotton gin means is that the types of cotton that can be planted are now going to include types of cotton that have really small seeds. Before the cotton gin, when pulling the seeds out was a manual process. The, the bread's all going to wind up at the top, and then you guys will just have to find the garbage up there, bring it down, and we're done. Or take it outside and give it, if you give it to the birds, they'll get a belly ache, so whatever. Um, we don't have any geese on this campus. The cotton gin would allow the separation of the fibers, the, the white part, from the seeds, or the seeds from the fiber, either way. Uh, and without the cotton gin, they could only grow, I already said this, the, the cotton with the long seed, seeds in it. So in 1821, which is early in cotton years, you can see where cotton's grown. So it's grown over here in the Piedmont region. There's a little bit of cotton that's grown down here uh, in the alluvial region. There's a little bit here in the upland region, but there's not a whole lot of cotton that's being grown in 1821. The